I want to talk about some things that are very important. Uh, these are things that are intrinsically tied to living a full life. If we're to have life to the full, as Jesus wanted, what we're talking about here today is at the center of it. Amen? You know, everywhere we turn, people have expectations of us. Bosses have expectations. Customers have expectations. Family, friends, police, mentors, leaders, all with expectations of us in our lives. And yet, we have expectations. We even have expectations of God. And that's at the center of what we're discussing today. I want to look at a classic battle of expectations between God and man. Turn to Genesis 15. Now, in this case, the man we're discussing is the father of our faith. And at this point, his name wasn't Abraham. God had not changed it yet. His name was simply Abram, an incomplete name for what he would receive. In Genesis 15, 1, the Bible says, After this, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. Do not be afraid, Abram. Sometimes a lot of our expectations come out of fear. Do not be afraid, Abram. I am your shield, your very great reward. Well, that's a pretty amazing statement to come from God. I'd like to think that if God came to me and said, hey, don't be afraid, I got you. I'm your shield. I'm your reward. That I'd be like, amen, I'm good. And yet, at various times in my own life, that's not true. Just like Abram right here. Let's look at what Abram says. But Abram said, oh, sovereign Lord, what can you give me? <laughs> what? <laughs> Woo! But he had a reason why he said this. Out of a very deep desire that he made into a need in his life. Now, I don't know if you can relate to having a desire that you want so badly that you speak of it and act about it and talk about it like it's a need. But this is where Abram was at. And I think we've all been in this place before. What can you give me since I remain childless and the one who will inherit my estate is Eleazar of Damascus. And Abram said, you have given me no children. So a servant, a servant in my household will be my heir. Get a little hot in the room. <laughs> Woo! Talk about a battle. God expects Abram to be grateful to be fired up, that he's his shield, he's his reward, I got great plans for you, my plans are right, they're best. And then there's the other side of the battle. You haven't given me what I want. And my life's a wreck because you haven't answered my prayers. When God is not a reward, we get really bored. And we put down our sword. See, God's expectations and goals for your life and mine are aimed at our happiness. And those expectations can be summed up in the title of our sermon. God's expectations, happy, fruitful disciples. It's so simple, it goes right over our head. See, God has expectations. I call those god expectations. You got to put a new name on it because the only expectations that matter in this life are God's expectations. Because his expectations are tied to everyone else's expectations in our life and how we respond to it. Let's explore this battle of expectations and desires. Let's go to Mark chapter 4. Mark chapter 4, there was a point when Jesus felt like he had to have a little chat with the disciples. And he told the parable to all the people. It went right over their head. They didn't understand it. So Jesus pulled them aside and said, let me explain this to you. Let me explain this parable of the sower that I just, that I just gave to the people that they didn't understand. And neither do you. That's why I'm gathering you around to explain it to you. 
In Mark, Mark 4, verse 15, Jesus said, Some people are like seed along the path where the word is sown. Now, we can sow the word by sharing our faith with somebody to get them to come to church and, and get them into studies to help them be a great follower of Jesus. But we can also sow the word in what we call discipling times where we help one another and we share God's word because it's not really a D time if you don't share God's word, right? It's a U time, a friend time, but it's not a D time if you don't open up the Bible. And if you share God's word, then you've planted a seed. And it will go one of several ways. Well, the first way is the seed along the path. It says where the word is sown. As soon as they hear it, Satan comes and takes it away. See, but you take that like you didn't, they didn't listen to me. They didn't listen. No, Satan took it away. And he takes away the word that was sown in them. So that could be the person's like, nah, not interested. Don't want to come to church. Don't want to do a Bible study. Or that could be that person that's defensive when you're talking to them in discipling time. I know that doesn't really happen here, but it's thought I'd cover it in case it happened, you know, in one of, the, one of our D times. He says, others, like seeds sown on the rocky places, hear the word and at once receive it with joy. But since they have no root, right, they only last a short time. That's the person that comes to church and gets involved gets baptized, becomes a member of the church, and then they, then maybe they read something online and they don't like what they read and they go, oh, I don't know if this is right, and they take off a week later, right? Now, how do I know that's true that they probably read something online? Well, look what it says right here. When trouble or persecution comes because of the word, they quickly fall away. Still others, like seed sown among thorns, hear the word, but the worries of this life, the deceitfulness of wealth, and desires, desires for other things, choke it out. And choke out what? The word. Making it unfruitful. Others, like seeds sown on good soil, hear the word, accept it, and produce a crop. 30, 60, or even 100 times what was sown. I think that's what God's going for in all of our lives here today, man. Like Abraham, we tend to withhold accepting the word. We tend to fight hardship. And we tend to hold back from bearing fruit until God obeys our desires and gives us what we want. In turn, God's response is to withhold giving us the desires of our hearts and the things that we pray for until we allow him to be the shield and acknowledge him in our life in, our, in the way we walk as our great reward. And yet he can't be our great reward if we won't let him be that reward. Point number one today, be happy. Be happy. See, God wants happy, fruitful disciples. So point number one is be happy. Point number two is going to be be fruitful. <laughs> Point number three is going to be be Jesus' disciple. You see, you guys are all in it already. That's awesome. That's awesome. But I got you. Point number one is be happy your purpose. We get, a, we get the purpose and mission all twisted up. And, and frankly, as a preacher of 30 years, I'm tired of seeing preachers mess this up. See, your purpose is to walk like Jesus. It's to seek God with all your heart. Amen? And you know, when we, when we do Bible studies with people that come to church, the very first scripture we read to them is about this. Go to Psalm 119, verse 1. <laughs> Psalm 119, verse 1. Of course, we cover the purpose in the very first scripture that we read to people. He says, blessed are they whose ways are blameless. Now, who's blameless in here? Okay, I'm raising my hand because Jesus' blood makes me blameless. Anybody else want to raise their hand to acknowledge that, that, that your sins are all forgiven and, and God won't judge you for all of them? See why this is at the center of our purpose? Blessed are they whose ways are blameless, who walk according to the law of the Lord. 
Blessed are they who keep his statutes and seek him with what? All your heart. You see, what's intrinsically tied to seeking God with all of your heart is doing it with all your heart. It's doing it with all your heart. At any given time, you or anybody, God, anyone could ask you right now, are you seeking God with all your heart? And that's the answer, quiet. It's always the answer, quiet. And, and we've got we've to regear our minds here because you can always do something better or greater and you've got to stop letting that affect you. You're either on a daily basis having times with God, praying to him, and prayerfully praying the Lord's prayer on a regular basis since that's how Jesus said to pray. Or, or, or you're not. And, and, it's, and if you're doing it every day, and it could, just, it could be a little better, just don't do that to yourself. You're seeking him. And, and we get so insecure when it comes to the Lord. But there's no insecurity behind a shield that's from God. Now, to illustrate how important the scripture is, we got to read on a little further, okay? Because we've got to understand the dynamics of seeking God with all our heart and what that looks like. And so, let's just read this again. Blessed are they whose ways are blameless, right? Who walk according to the law of the Lord. So, what's a, what's, just yell it out. What's one word to describe walking according to the law of the Lord? One word. Obedience. See, we get it. We get it. So there's no, there's no seeking God with all your heart without what? Obedience. So let's see if this isn't a theme in the rest of the chapter here. Verse 3, they do nothing wrong. Is that obedient? Or disobedient? Okay, all right. They walk in his ways. Are we getting a pattern here? You have laid down precepts that will be fully what? Obey. All that my ways were steadfast in obeying your decrees. Then I would not be put to shame when I consider your law. See, when you're not walking in obedience, you're filled with shame. And you throw away the reward and you throw the shield down. And he says here, I will praise you with an upright heart as I learn your righteous laws. Oh, I will obey your decrees. Do not utterly forsake me. It's interesting that he's talking about, do not utterly forsake me. Why? Because he doesn't always obey, just like us. How can a young man keep his way pure? Well, isn't that the question for our century? <laughs> young man, how do you stay pure? Maybe you do. Maybe you don't. If you don't, here's why. Right here. By living according to your word. This is why Titus 2 says, teach young men uh, self-control. Because self-control is at the center of obedience. Right? So if you're struggling with your purity, it's because you're not obeying God. As a pattern of your life. And today is the day to get it on straight. Amen, young brothers? All right. Amen, older brothers? <laughs> oh, and the sisters. This applies to you too, right? Okay, all right. Just making sure. Just making sure. He says, I seek you with all my heart. Do let, let me stray from your commands. I've hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. Mm. Praise be to you, O Lord. Teach me your decrees. Do you know, the person that prayed this was a Jew, right? Jews were taught the scriptures from birth. They knew the scriptures. They could recount entire books of the scripture. So why are they praying to be able to understand it and learn it? See, the Jews understood something that we could glean in our own lives. Just because you've heard the scripture before doesn't mean you're living it out. And if you're not living it out, you don't know it. If you're not living it out, you don't know it. Maybe you did, but you lost it. And you got to get it back. Amen? 
Praise be to you, O Lord. Teach me your decrees. With my lips I recount all the laws that come from your mouth. I rejoice in following your statutes as one rejoices in great riches. I meditate on your precepts and consider your ways. I delight in your decrees. I will not neglect your word. There's a lot of talk about meditation that's going on all over social media. But I have yet to see one talk about meditating on God's word. And yet meditation is at the center of living a full life with God. And I find most people only put enough time to read, read a few scriptures, do a hokey prayer, and don't meditate on anything. And then we wonder why life is so hard. Why do we stray? Because we do not pray to obey. Every church on the planet, whether they teach the truth, whether they're off on their doctrine, and newsflash, every church has something a little off somewhere. Why? Because churches are built by men. And men are not God. And only God's word is right. But every church has this one problem. The willful refusal to be happy. Every church has this problem. Because everybody, every single one of us gets to this place where we're not getting what we want from God, so we willfully stop being happy. It's like, a, it's like blackmailing God. And you're an example for the world, but you're not a light at that time. You put it under a bowl, the Bible says. See, we are called to be happy. In fact, verses 1 and 2 call us to superlatively happy, which means happiness to the highest degree. You couldn't get more happy. It's where we're supposed to be every single day. You go, well, you don't know what's happening in my life. I love that answer. I love that answer. You know why? I don't need to know what's going on in your life. All I need to know is God says you're supposed to be happy and you're not. And you're either going to seek understanding how to get there, you're going to defend your position. And we spend so much time explaining why we're not happy that, <laughs> that we forget that happiness is actually a matter of obedience to God. Yeah. Happiness is a decision. It's not a, it's not a state that you're put in. It's a state you choose to be in. And you willfully make that choice. It's your will against God's will when you're not happy. And if you were God, why would you give you anything? Why would you give you anything if you're going to just walk around mopey? Do parents do that with their kids? Can you imagine our world if we pandered to our children and gave them everything they want every time they copped a little attitude? What a world. We, do you think it's bad now? And God's the greatest father ever. And so you walk around sad and think that your, your pity party is going to make God obey you. And that's just not going to happen. It's not the God that we serve. He's God. He's king. He's your great reward. He's your shield. He's your everything, but you've thrown him down. You either pick him up and put him on, or you throw him down on the ground like a dirty rag. And we've got to decide, like, are you going to choose to be happy? Because you have every reason to be happy if you know God. You have a thousand more reasons than anybody on the planet to be happy because you know God. And by the way, he put his spirit in you. So you have every reason to follow your God and be a happy disciple. <laughs> Happiness is the result of one decision. One decision. To walk with your, your God in obedience, seeking him with all your heart. You decide that every day, man, it's going to be a whole different ballgame in your life. It's crazy because disciples of Jesus are called to be the most obedient people on the planet. I mean, you look at the 12. They were a mess. But after he died and resurrected and they had his spirit, they never faltered after that. They never fell back. They pushed forward through everything that happened the rest of their life. You know, this week we, uh, we celebrated my son Dylan's 24th birthday. <laughs> And, and for years now, every year, people share about my son Dylan. And there's just something special about him. 
he's just, wow, I mean, he's so happy, he's fired up, seems to have all this wisdom, da 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 you know, and, uh, and, and you know, that just didn't, that didn't just happen, you know what I mean? I mean, first off, he married like a, he married like a mini version of his mother, <laughs> who in any years is going to be greater, him and her, than my wife and I, and, and that, that helps him so much. But do you want to know why he's so, quote, special? Really simple. He's obeying this passage. I'll never forget he came to Atlanta to visit with us. And uh, I got up in the morning, and I went in the room. <clears throat> and I didn't see him at first. But, you know, you kind of see, like, the blanket, and there's, like, a little bump. <laughs> and, and I saw a blanket, and it looked like the bed, but it wasn't. I walked around. He was on his knees praying. And he had the blanket over him, you know, and, and all that. But he does that every day. And the thing that was so encouraging about his birthday wasn't all the comments about him and all that. It's what Jazzy shared about him. Never does a day go by that you don't pray with me. Man, I could have died and gone to heaven right there. That is awesome. It's awesome. He's just simply walking with his God every day and calling his wife to walk with him. And she calls him to do the same when he's struggling. You know, it's amazing how many times in this verse, 16 verses, God says or implies, obey me. And, and, but you've got to see the correlation between happiness and obedience to God. At least 12 times in 16 verses, God says, seek me, but that means obey me. Your purpose is to follow Jesus and be a happy disciple of God's way. Amen? Yeah. Number two, be fruitful. Your mission. See, to walk like Jesus is your purpose in life. Nothing else works without that. But you have a powerful mission that you're to be focused on each day. Go to John 15, verse 1. <clears throat> John 15, verse 1. Jesus says, I am the vine, and my Father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that what? Bears no fruit. Do you know what has to happen for you to qualify to, for bearing no fruit? You have to be unhappy. You have to be unhappy, and you have to be not making any disciples of Jesus. And um, sadly, we can get there. I've now been a disciple for 30 years, and uh, to this, year, this year is year number 31, actually. And I've had years that I've gone without being fruitful and being pretty unhappy most of the time. We, we have times in our life where this happens, and yet it... But if we're not able to identify it, we'll never get out of it. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit. <clears throat> While every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes so it will be even more fruitful. Now, I love what he says right here in verse 3. You are already clean because of the word I've spoken to you. See, you're already clean because of God's word. You're already clean. You're blameless, as we read in the other scripture, because of what Jesus did for you. He says, remain in me, and I will remain in you. Now, every time you see a scripture like this, you got to, like, flip it. You know what I'm saying? So you have to go, okay, if I don't remain in him, what's that mean? God is very conditional. Now, it took 40 years for that to happen with the Israelites. Some of you haven't even been around half that amount of time to have that happen to you. But we get so worried, like, am I going to fall away? Did I fall away? Oh, my gosh. We should stand confident in what Jesus did for us. The more insecure we get, the more we make that maybe true. Now, he says here, I am the vine, you are the branches. Okay, so hello, branches. Good to meet you all today. 
If a man remains in me and I in him, he will what? Bear much fruit. He says that apart from me. See, if you want something more than the shield and the reward, oopsie, you can do nothing. If you have a desire that's greater than your desire for what God has already given you, then you can't do anything, the Bible says. If anyone does not remain in me, he's like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up and thrown into the fire and burn. Again, that takes, that takes a lot for that to happen. Many churches, it's so hard that many churches in the past just start saying it's impossible. Once saved, always saved. But Hebrews 6 says, oh, says completely different. This scripture says completely different. And so we better be aware that we can lose it. But again, the 40-year principle comes into play with the foreshadowing from the Old Testament of what that would look like. You'd have to be in that condition for a long time. He says, if you remain in me and my words remain in you, right? You've meditated on them and you've obeyed them. Ask whatever you wish and it will be given. Now, is it starting to become clear why some prayers don't get answered right here? Right? When we're not remaining in him, he's not going to just spoil us. He's too good of a dad to spoil us. He says, this is to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Now remain in my love. Can you imagine, have you ever loved somebody and they didn't love you back? So, so can you imagine how God feels about you when you're doing this to him? Because he's always loving you. And then here you come in the room. Oh, somebody's looking at me. <laughs> Can you imagine what's going through God's mind and heart when that happens? Can you imagine how proud he can't be of you when you're faking it in front of people? We got to keep it real in the church. Usually we keep it real when we're like really angry and we're like, blah, 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 blah. No, I'm just keeping it real, bro. No, you're keeping it sinful because you threw the shield and the reward down. So can you keep it real without making it sinful? Is the answer, right? He says, if you obey my commands, you will remain in my love. Oh, snap. So when I'm disobedient, I'm not remaining in his love. Just as I have obeyed my father's commands and remain in his love. I've told you this so that my joy may be in you. So see, a preacher has to tell you that you need to stay obedient or you lose your joy because you've lost your love for God. Because you want something more than God because God is not enough. And if you don't do that, you're like a branch that withers, he says. My command is this, love each other as I have loved you. Greater love is no one than this, that he lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends if you do what I command. I no longer call you servant because a servant doesn't know his master's business. This is huge. As a follower of God, a person who God has taken his spirit and put into your heart, put into your life, you actually know God's business. The only reason you don't know is if you squash that spirit. So you're supposed to have answers for everything. You're supposed to be the one that everybody turns to. You're supposed to be the one where people are like, how'd you do that when that all that happened? I don't get it. Why are you so happy all the time? I don't, I think, I, I don't think you're like that the rest of the week. I think you just do it on Sunday. You know, I say it like that when I'm preaching right now, but I said that to the disciples when I, when I was studying. I said, I'm going to stay with you while I study the Bible because I don't believe you are all like this all week long. I started the studies on, I, I guess I should say Sunday, Monday morning because it was 12.30 a.m. I was baptized Saturday morning after spending a week with these guys. Why? They were the real deal. 
How do you expect to not be the real deal? Walk around mopey, angry, sad, whatever, every negative thing you can do, and expect that God's going to bless your life. He's a good father. He says, Instead, I have called you friends. Wow. Like God is your friend. He wants you to think of him as your friend. He wants you to talk to him as he is your friend. I hear people pray many times, and they're like, Father God, I just want to ask you, Father God, for Father God uh, to help me, Father God, because, Father God, you were so awesome, Father God. <laughs> I, mean, do you t I, I mean, do you talk to your friends like that? I don't talk to my friends like that. I know, hey, babe, love you, babe. Hey, babe, can you help me, babe? Because, babe, you're my babe. I mean... <laughs> How do you expect it to be real with God when you're not real with Him? you got to keep it real in your prayers. And it takes time to get there. It was so weird after I got baptized. So the, the brothers every morning went out with me, every single morning at 5 a.m. and prayed with me and taught me how to pray. One brother named Mark Shea. And we're still buddies to this day. I just We just communicated last week. And, and all the guys that study with me, I'm friends with, and we, we got a little group together. They called us the Fab Five. It was the it was the nineties, you know. So but they did this with me. But what but when I had to do it without them, it was weird. I don't, I don't know if Michael's experiencing that. You just got baptized, you know. But but when you're praying, it's 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 weird. You're like, hi. You don't know where to look. You don't know what to say. You just got taught, but you're just like, ah. It's like a first date, right? So, so, but it takes time, but when you begin seeing the Spirit work in your life because you're remaining faithful. You're remaining obedient. It gets easier and easier over time. It says, I called you friends for everything I learned from my Father I made known to you. See, these are the kind, this is the kind of mentor that you and I are supposed to be for the people God puts in our life. And if you're full of the Spirit and you're full of like, the fruit of God's Spirit and you're being obedient, you are a shining light. God is going to give you somebody to help become a disciple. The only reason he doesn't give people is if that's not happening. And we make bearing fruit about trying. I hear people all the time, I'm trying to bear fruit. You don't try to bear fruit. You, just, you bear fruit. An apple tree is not like, apple. Oh, thank the Lord. <laughs> this, uh, apple tree just bears apples because it's, it's rooted down in the ground and it's getting its nutrients and it just does what it does. And we got to stop trying to bear fruit and remain in him and remain obedient and let the fruit happen the way God wants it to happen. And he says, you did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you to go and bear fruit, fruit that will last. Then the Father will give you whatever you ask in my name. And again, he reaffirms what it takes to get him to answer your prayers, to walk with him in obedience and to bear fruit. You know, God expects you to remain in him. He also expects every single disciple of Jesus to bear fruit. And, and you know, I just got to address this. In most churches, you know, we're, you hear all over the place the 80-20 rule. 20% of the people do 80% of the work. That's, that's not God's kingdom. That is not an analogy that belongs in the church. Because God calls every single disciple of Jesus to bear fruit. Amen? It is not for a few select people in the church to be fruitful all the time and not you. It is your calling as much as it's everybody else's calling, as much as it's the evangelist's calling, to bear fruit and make disciples. And when 20% of the church is bearing fruit and 80% is not, that is not a healthy church. That is a sick church that is off track. 
I, I remember in Atlanta, we had all but two people in our entire congregation bear fruit in one year. It's the most glorious year ever. How can you celebrate most people not bearing fruit and call it healthy? How can you celebrate lots of fruit that does not last and call that healthy? God has a different view, and we cannot be pulled away from it. Even when we teach a study that we call the discipleship study, we talk about the pastor that baptizes somebody every single day. And no offense, Bob, but we call him Pastor Bob. It's not that Bob. And we talk about this guy that, that baptizes somebody every day of the year. And we pit him up against the plan of God that every year, every disciple makes another disciple. And how 13 years down the road is such a different story. Yet we cannot allow ourselves to get drug out of the plan of God into a plan that makes a bunch of superheroes or a few superheroes in a church while everybody else is desolate. We need every disciple of Jesus to bear fruit every single year. The consequence of not bearing fruit, the fruit of the Spirit and the fruit of disciples, is to wither. It's to wither. And yet, why do we wither? We wither because we don't want to suffer. That's why we wither. You know, you are a branch. We established that. Our, Jesus did it earlier, right? Four things happen to branches. Okay? Four things happen to branches. Wither, get cut off and thrown into the fire, or bear fruit and get pruned. Those are the four things that happen to branches. You can just call those four categories of your life that everything fits into. And, and both, here's the funny thing. It's not really funny when it happens. But both withering and getting pruned really, really hurt. They really hurt really bad. Now, I want you to put that in the context of making a disciple and baptizing them 365 times a year. How much is that pruning going to hurt? How often is that going to happen? It's not the plan of God. One a year, you get pruned once a year, and you, you take that one big lesson and you move it on. That sounds more like the plan that God's working on. But why wither? Withering comes from not passing the test of faithfulness. First Peter talks about the test and being refined by fire. And when we're not passing those tests, it's because we're withering, because we're running from the test. But you're a snapshot in time, so you can pass the test today. You can pass the test tomorrow. But the longer you go not passing the test, the harder it is. And here's a, here's a truth. If you're not a happy, fruitful disciple, you can't make a happy, fruitful disciple. You know, I share my faith every day. I just baptize somebody. If you're not a happy, fruitful disciple, you cannot make a happy, fruitful disciple. And if you're withering and on track not to last, you can't make disciples that will last. Somebody else will have to get in and intervene for that person to stay faithful. Now, if sharing your faith, studying the Bible, serving, and if that's all the center of happiness, is if we're supposed to get our happiness from those things, then let me ask you, why are you wrestling with attitudes and disappointments while you're doing these things? Why does your mood change with the blowing of the Spirit's winds is bringing things in your life and out of your life? If all these things in your life are the things that make you happy, are supposed to be, it's because the only thing that will make us happy is our shield and our reward that is our great God. Amen? Amen. Go to Hebrews 12.5. Hebrews 12.5. Let's talk about how to get through these hardships. Of course, God gives us hardships, or he allows there to be hardships. You think about Job. Job went to God. Uh, Satan went to God, and God was like, hey, what's up? He's like, nothing. I'm just hanging out on the earth. He's like, oh, okay, great. How about, have you, talk, have you, have you seen my, my servant Job? He's like, no other person. Oh, yeah, I want at him. Okay, go for it. Just don't kill him. Now, why do you think that he's not going to do that with you as well? 
what makes you so special that God should not do that with you when he believes in you so much? He says in verse 5, And you have forgotten the word of encouragement that addresses you as sons. My son, do not make light of the Lord's discipline. So when tough things happen, we're not supposed to make light of it. What do you think one of the greatest ways we make light of God's discipline when he lets there be hardship? We focus on people instead of the hardship. Oh, well, this person said that. That person said, I don't like the way you said that. You ever been there? We make it all about people instead of our great reward. That comes after we prove faithful in the tests. We can even do it with our spouses. I know a lot of you want to get married, but if you get married, at some point your spouse is going to focus on you and say you're the reason why they're not doing well. That's going to happen. You thought it was all roses and, and all good stuff. And it is at times. The more roses, the more good stuff. But, it's, but it doesn't matter. Make it your best friend. Eventually, you'll blame your best friend. Eventually, you'll blame, blame your Bible talk leader or your discipler. A discipler is somebody that we have that, that's kind of a, that two people assigned to each other to help each other out spiritually. Or it's your boss. My boss hates me. No, you're not passing the test that God has for you. Your, your boss may hate you, but you'll overcome that by just being a disciple, whether your boss actually hates you or not. See, we attribute all these reasons why there's hardship rather than going to God and seeking him with all of our heart and then obeying whatever he's testing us with. He says, and do not lose heart when he rebukes you because the Lord disciplines those he loves and he punishes everyone he accepts as a son. Now, this word punish is kind of crazy. God's going to punish me? The Aramaic words here, there's 11 times the word discipline shows up in Hebrews 12. There's three different Aramaic words. One means education. The other means mentoring. And the third means like a family time, like a parent training their child, right? So the first couple of ones are like the education, like you're at school. Do not make light of the Lord's discipline. Do not lose heart when he rebukes you. Now it switches to a different word to the one with a father training his children. The Lord disciplines, the Lord trains his children that he loves and then punishes. This is the same word that comes from John 19, verse 1, where it says, Pilate therefore had Jesus flogged. And I don't know why all the translators got this so wrong, but all of them did on all the versions. And I, I don't think I'm smarter than all of them. But when you're a disciple and you're reading the Bible as a disciple of Jesus, there's things you see that this, the world doesn't. And so what he's saying right here is, is you have coaches, you have leaders in your life that they're training you. you know. But then you have me, God, who's your father, training you as my child. And I, just like I let Jesus be flogged and, and crucified, I will let you be flogged as well because you need it to go where I'm taking you. He says, endure hardship as education. God is treating you as sons. For what son is not trained by his father? And if you're not trained by your father, and everyone's trained by their father, then you're illegitimate children and not true sons. See, it makes a lot more, it makes a lot more sense when you read this passage the right way. He says, moreover, we've all had coaches. As he, he uses the word for discipline like a coach, mentoring. We've all had fathers who coached us, and we respected them for it. How much more should we submit to the father of our spirits and live? Our human fathers, they, they, they coached us for a little while as they thought best, but God trains his children for their good, that they may share in his holiness. No education seems pleasant at the time, but painful. Later on, however, it produces a... It produces a harvest of righteousness and peace. For who? Not for everybody. For those who don't focus on people and let the hardship train them. Therefore, strengthen your feeble arms and weak knees. Make level paths for your feet so the lame may not be disabled. In other words, so the world sees you march through your problems and be healed rather than disabled. 
You know, pruning comes because you're fruitful. And if you pass the test of pruning, then you will actually be even more fruitful. And that means you'll have more best friends, more people in your Bible talk, more people to take the load of the work off your shoulders. And yet you and I get to select our pain. There's going to be pain emotionally no matter what. There's going to be the pain of disobedience and the consequences that inevitably come. And by the way, God tells you what the consequences are. He doesn't make them happen. He tells you what's going to happen already. I mean, he's, got, he's like full disclosure, friends. Hey, if you disobey, here's what's going to happen. And then when it happens, we're like, God did that. To no, God told you that was going to happen. He was warning you. And yet, when we get pruned, it's painful. I mean, have you ever seen a bush that's been pruned? Like a big rose bush? We had rose bushes that were like this high in front of our house that we were renting when we were in L.A., and they came out and pruned it. And it was like this little nub, like this big, from like gargantuan to like this, and this little stubbles that used to be the branches. So there's a difference between the branch being cut off and it cuts into the root and the branch is gone and just having a stubble of the branch. That's you after you are fruitful. When you're fruitful with a new disciple, you get pruned and, and there's just a little stubble. Why? Because that one branch is going to be more fruitful than the entire thing before. And that's the life that all of us want. We've just got to get through the pain and learn from it so we can get there. Amen? Amen. You only get the fruit when you remain in the root. Be a disciple of Jesus. Remain in him and prove to Jesus that you are his disciple. Lastly, be Jesus' disciple. Matthew 28, verse 16. Then the 11 disciples went to, the, went to Galilee, to the mount where Jesus had told them to go. And when they saw him, they worshiped him. But some doubted. Three years with Jesus. And some of the disciples doubted when they went to the mountain. You know, how do these jokers doubt? The same reason I doubt. The same reason you doubt. Because they're just like us. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. Perfectly you can see in this scripture what we have been studying in the first and second point. He says, Obey everything I have commanded you. That is the first point. Be happy. Be obedient. He says, go make disciples of all nations. See, be fruitful. But then we, the, the culmination of it is the be his disciple part. Be focused on it. You know, uh, on August 25th, we're going to have a bring your neighbor day. And that is geared to help you and me be fruitful. We said, okay, we're going to take, we're going to slow it down in the church here over the summer and and, you know, we're going to have a summer of fun and love and boom, boom, boom. Well, summer's almost over. And right at the end of August, we're going to have a Bring Your Neighbor Day and get focused on bringing new family members into the church for the rest of the year. Amen? And this is us as the leaders calling you back to your purpose, back to your mission. Because some, for some reason, when we get all caught up in fun and love and all this stuff, that we, that we for some reason, pull away from God sometimes during that time. And so this is the call to get refocused on your relationship with God. Because you go share your faith and bring all the people you want, but if you're not remaining in him, you're not going to bear fruit. And that would be a lot of wasted work to go bring all these people and not remain in him so they have a chance to have the spirit come out of you and influence them. You know, leadership has expectations of a church. And... The main expectation is calling disciples to live the way Jesus says to live as a disciple. And so we're calling you to Jesus' expectations. But after calling the people to this, the people are supposed to do the same thing they do in seeking God, obey. And, and so Hebrews 13, 17, 
the beginning of the scripture talks about obey your leaders, submit to their authority, blah, blah, blah. And yet it says pray for us. So Paul is the leader, calls them to be obedient to all their leaders, and then says pray for us. We are sure that we have a clear conscience and desire to live honorably in every way. That's the way leaders in the kingdom of God are supposed to be calling people. See, but if God is not your shield and your great reward, then you will not know if your leader's living in an honorable way or not. Because you have to walk with the Spirit for the Spirit to give you wisdom so you know what to follow and what not to follow. In Hebrews 13, 7, he says, Remember your leaders who spoke the word of God to you. Consider the outcome of their way of life. So you're actually supposed to watch your leader's way of life. Not just every word or everything they say or do, but you're supposed to watch what is the outcome of my leader's life? What does it look like? And sometimes it looks good, sometimes it doesn't. Now, he doesn't say be critical of your leaders and the outcome of their way of life. Why? He's wanting you to look for all the good. Now, if you, now, now, if you built a great relationship with your leader and you feel great, I mean, I can tell you anybody that I disciple is free to come and tell me things. Jay does it all the time. He has no problem with that one. <laughs> and I appreciate that. Ray does it all the time. Eric does it all the time. He pulled back a little bit lately, but he's just getting, <laughs> staying in there. But you, you should be able to go to your leader and share things that you see without feeling like there will be lashback. And if there's lashback, then they're not living in an honorable way. Because even if you're wrong, there should be a godly response. There should still be a thank you for... I mean, it takes courage to go to somebody that's over you and has authority in some way and share. And we need to make it easy for you to share. And if you do that, you will get a thank you from me. I love feedback. I love being trained. I'm a disciple, so I learn from anybody. It doesn't matter who they are in the church. If Michael, who just got baptized, he's like, hey, bro, can I talk to you for a minute? The way I thought, saw you say that is just, I don't know if that was good. would be like, wow, thank you, Michael. It's awesome. Thank you for caring about me and my example and the way I represent God. And we need to build a fellowship where that is true. And so, but we're supposed to, he says, consider the outcome of their way of life and imitate their faith. Anyone that God has put in any leadership position has already proved faithful or God would not let them be there. So we are called to imitate the faith that that person has. Maybe we address some things, but we always imitate the faith in their life. And he says, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. And that's your grounding point right there. If someone's not living in an honorable way that's leading you, then you have Jesus is always the same. And you follow him and you support that person until they get where they need to be. Do not be carried away by all kinds of strange teachings. It is good for our hearts to be strengthened by grace, not by ceremonial foods, which are of no value to those who eat them. And I love what it says right here. We have an altar from which those who minister at the tabernacle have no right to eat. How special are you as a follower of God in the 21st century? You have a right that the Levites didn't have in the tabernacle. Every person that led people in the Old Testament that's a leader has no right to eat at the table that you and I will get to eat at when we get to heaven. Since the first century, Jesus has never changed. And you and I have a purpose. It's to follow Jesus with all our heart and obedience. And if you do that, you're going to be what? Happy. You know, I watched a movie called Twisters. It's been out long enough. I'm going to spoil it if you haven't seen it. I'm the movie spoiler preacher, so. But you know, it's the same storyline as the old Twisters, just modified. It's actually better in my opinion. But in the movie, the girl who was the storm chaser got overwhelmed because some people that she was chasing storm with got killed. And, and, she, and it was her fault. And, and so when she came back to try and storm chase, 
when it came time to put the device up in the tornado, she faltered and didn't do it. And as they kept trying to go out and get more tornadoes, she just kept failing out of all of the fear of losing people. I don't know if you can relate. And the guy that was, you know, they did a twist where the guy that was the bad guy in the first movie started out as the bad guy and became the good guy. It's pretty cool. But as he became the good guy, they were, they were in a barn, and she was terrified. And he just looked at her, and he said, how much more are you going to let these tornadoes take from you? I was like, oh, snap! <laughs> oh, my gosh! That was such a great line. But I have a question for all of us today. I usually only ask one question that's going to cut your heart really deep, you know? Each sermon, maybe two, but I have a question for you. How much are you going to keep letting all your tornadoes steal from you? The forgiveness and grace that Jesus gives us is to be the engine that strengthens your heart. But the only way that won't strengthen your heart is if you want something more than you want the forgiveness of sins that you already have. And I got a newsflash for you. Jesus isn't going to go die for you again so you can be forgiven. It's a one and done. You got to keep your gratitude for what he did. Isn't your salvation and the salvation of others something worth fighting for? Something worth suffering for? Isn't it worth something to die for? It's your choice how you suffer. You can suffer as a happy, fruitful disciple or as an unhappy, fruitless future fall away. You know, when God is not a reward, we get really bored and we put down our sword. Why do we stray? Because we do not pray to obey. And you only get fruit when you remain in the root. Today it's time to get on board with God's expectations in the scriptures. It's time to fill your role that God has in your life. Decide today to be a happy, fruitful disciple of Jesus who makes lots of happy, fruitful disciples of Jesus that last. Then and only then can we say, and to God be all the glory. I love you all very much.